Hey everyone, welcome to Bridge Stories. This is our new podcast, giving people space and time to tell their stories of encountering God and being changed by Him. We hope you're encouraged by these stories and also that you leave excited that you know a lot of really awesome people a little bit better. So sit back and enjoy. Okay. Let's begin the season finale. I don't know if you know, uh, this is the end of season one. Some people listening might not know that, but um, we saved uh, hopefully one of the very best for last. So I'm here with... uh, What a nice statement to start this conversation. I hope I haven't set the bar too high, Millie. (laughs) Well, I'm here with uh, Millie. We used to be co-workers officially, but uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're co-workers forever, Mm -hmm. right? Forever. Yeah, and uh, we're friends. We share uh, mm-hmm. some history and some time together. But why don't you uh, introduce yourself, and we'll jump right in. Well, I just should say before I say anything about myself that I love your baby, oh. your little boy. <laughs> yeah, I bought a, a new sucker for him yesterday, oh. and so I'm going to give it to him. And it's a really nice sucker. It's not these ch- cheap ones I've been giving him, but he loves it, and I love him. You know what you've been giving him? You've been giving him the ring pop? Yes, yes. He is obsessed with it. He thinks it's so cool that he gets to slide it on his finger. I, and then I, I got a it. whole bunch more for him. <laughs> so You're reeling him in the old-fashioned way with sugar and yeah, candy. Yeah. <laughs> so introduce yourself, Millie. Who are you? Well, I am Millie Britt, and I have been in this church since day one. And before that, I went to Melody Land and was on staff for 10 years, and before that I was in the Lutheran Church, Um, and I was there for 15 years. So I've been saved. I got saved when I was 12, Yeah, and I've been in church ever since. So uh, as you're just mentioning being 12, um, tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Where where were you born? What was your your childhood kind of like? Well, you know, Andy... um, that's why I appreciate so much that you let me share my testimony because my childhood was not was not fun. And every time I share it, and I have many times, I realize what God did. Hmm. And I'm, I'm impressed even. I go, well, that's right, God, you did do that, didn't you? So here I was living in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Where is La Crosse? Was- it's not too far from Minneapolis and St. Paul. Okay, so it's right along the Mississippi River. Okay. And I was living there, and I was the youngest of 12, and uh, my dad was an alcoholic. Okay. That is the big factor that changed everything in my life for a long, long, long time. So 12 kids. I'd I'd imagine some kind of moved out. You didn't live with all of them all at once. But what was your house like with that many children? How many? Well, see, our home was confusion. It was, because my dad rarely came home that he had not been drinking. Rarely. I don't hardly remember a time. Mm. Um, So we kind of all ran our own ways. Uh, uh, Quite a number of my siblings were gone and out of the home before I was even born. So as as uh, as a young girl, did you even know your dad was drunk, or was it just so common that that's just... Was it later the looking back was, that you realized that's what was going on? You know, Andy, by the time I was 9 or 10, I had gotten to know some kids in the area. Now, we didn't live in the city. We lived in the country. But if I walked 10 minutes, I could be at one of my friends' house. I had a girl that I started running around with, and I could be at her house in 10 minutes. And so I would see that their dads didn't. Yeah. So that's when you begin to realize. Start connecting the dots. And, and then you, you're also ashamed. Hmm. You're embarrassed. Yeah. And you're unhappy. And there was fighting, too. I mean, because he would come home drunk all the time. He and my mother fought. And so I would say from the time I was probably eight or nine years old, I had a lot of bad feelings mm-hmm. about my home. What was your mom's kind of reaction to all this, Millie? When I look back now, Andy, I realize she was just exhausted. Yeah. You have 12 kids and an alcoholic father. I mean, husband. There's no time. There's no money. They were, I, I remember we were always poor. Andy, I never remember getting a new dress. Hmm. I don't even remember getting Christmas presents. I'm sure there might have been some insignificant things, but... Yeah. I, I didn't. It was a very sad. There was no money. My dad got paid. He worked for the city. He had a reasonably good job, but he drank it all up. 
Hmm. And he was, and there was never, all I ever heard them argue about was money. There was never any money. Yeah. And of course, we kids didn't expect anything then because we knew we weren't going to get it. So it just became a sad, a sad, and the more I ran around with my friends and the more I was in their homes and saw that they had it different, the more I, I was unhappy. Wow. Yeah. Were, were you, um, you know, when you were young and you were experiencing all this, were you close with, with your siblings? Were you kind of binding together or, or was it more like you were just trying to get out of the house to hang out with your friends? Well, like I said, I was the youngest, and all, many of them were not there from the time I was born. Many of them I didn't know, only by a picture or by face, but mm. no relationship. They didn't come back. They didn't have a happy memory either, so they didn't come back. Once they were old enough to get out, they went. Um, some of them did well, some of them didn't. Uh, but it was, it was a sad thing because, like I said, once I realized that it shouldn't be like that, I regretted it, and I wanted out. I did from really from the very beginning. I kept thinking, nobody should have to live like this. No food many times, no food for days, no money, never got anything. Uh, we were poor because even though he had a reasonably good job, he drank it all up. Mm. Wow. So you, you keep mentioning 12 years old, and I, I know a bit of the story, but um, so 12 years old, what is that, fifth or sixth grade, something like that? And I can already see the smile fifth on your grade, face. Fifth grade. So, so what, what happens to you where 12 years old becomes kind of the well, major pivot of your whole life? I've told you that my story young on, it was not happy. I went to bed cold. We lived in Wisconsin, snow, rain, sleet, and hail. You gotta Real know winter. That. Real, yeah. yeah. And I went to bed with not enough blankets many, many, many times. I, I, so I wasn't an, a real happy person. But then one day, and I say that whenever I give my testimony, but then there was one day. Yeah. One day I went out to look for my friend who I'd gotten to know, and we were not that close, but, you know, she, I knew her, and I didn't have anybody else, and I was the youngest, and so I went out to look for her, <clears throat> and I kind of had run wild because nobody asked where you're going or what are you doing, and I was unhappy, so I kind of just ran from mm. place to place. Yeah. And um, I was out there waiting to see if I could find her when her mom and dad pulled up, and I saw she was in the car. And um, I said, oh, my gosh, I, I remember thinking, did I do something wrong? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I always was afraid I'd done something wrong. And um, the mom rolled down the window, and she said to me, Millie, we're going to, they called me Mildred in those days, but uh, Mildred, we're going to go to church, and we'd like you to go with us. Now, at this point in your life, do you have any... I had never been in church. You've never even been inside to one. I'd never been inside a church. I, I thought... Oh, and she said, well, it, it'll just be for an hour or so, and, and we'll bring you home. You would, you, would you like to? Well, now, Andy, you have to understand, when you come from this kind of a background, nobody asks you to go anywhere. I was dirty. Yeah. I didn't have clean clothes and cute clothes and didn't have my hair combed. I was, you know, and so my wor first word was, yeah, I'll go. Now, as far as I can remember... They never went to my home and said, by the way, we're taking your daughter to church. <laughs> they said, get in the car. I got in the car, and they drove the car to church. Okay, and what, what, what was the church? Do you remember what it was called? Lutheran. It was the Lutheran church, of course. Yeah, the Lutheran church is in very Wisconsin. big in Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota. Yeah. And, those. and it was in Salem, and they went there, and they we went in. And they put me in a room with other kids, which I loved. I thought it was just great. They were coloring, coloring, and drawing pictures and playing games. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, this must be a playground. I mean, I never, I just didn't, I just was so shocked. Anyway, so I stayed there for the whole service. And at the end, a young guy came in about your age and um I thought he was a pastor. He might have just been a youth leader or a teacher. I don't know now. But I just remember he came in, and he had all the children sit down in the front. There was probably 30 of them there. And he said to them, now, boys and girls, I've told you this before, and I want you to make sure you know this, that there is a God, yeah. and he's alive, and that God wants you to know him. There's a heaven and a hell and a God. There's a devil. And you have to choose. Well, Andy, I sat there, and I thought, what is he talking about? 
I have to choose. I don't know them. I don't know God. I don't know anything else. I don't. What is he talking about? <laughs> but I listened to it because I hungered for it, even though I didn't know it. Yeah. There was something in me that wanted to know everything that he had to say. So when it was over, it was about an hour and a half service. And when it was over, he came up to me and he said, Millie, the God you chose. Oh, that's right. When he had said there's heaven and a hell, you choose. I raised my hand. But I don't know why. I don't think he asked me to. I think I just did it. I don't know what to do. Anyway, yeah. so he said to me, Millie, the God you chose is in this book. He gave me a Bible. Wow. And he said, and if you, cho if you take it and you choose him like you did, then he'll talk to you, Andy. Everybody just stop for a minute and imagine a dirty little kid never had her been in a church and he's telling me I knew that God had to make the stars in the skies I could see that I, I knew people would tell me that all the time so that I knew but I thought he's going to talk to me I didn't believe it but I wanted to yeah so I went home and I took that Bible and I said I'm going to read it and today I sit at this table and for all those 50, 60, 70 years, I've been reading from Genesis to Revelation. Wow. Because he told me that he would talk to me, and Andy, he did. It wasn't no time at all before I would read a verse like uh, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And I, I would get down on the floor and cry and say, I'm not going to perish. Wow. I'm going to live. God, you know me. Yeah. You know my name. Yeah. I would cry, but I would read it over and over and over again because it was the only hope I'd had in a long time wow. in my life. Yeah, especially you were yes. so, so void of, of hope. Oh. And oh. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to adjust this for you. Is it too close? Uh, a little too close. You could pull it uh, like maybe a fist from your face would be great. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, perfect. That's great. So, and so um, that being the case, now I had met Jesus because all I can tell you, whether you believe it or anybody does or not, I am telling you this 12-year-old little kid, I met Jesus. Wow. I knew he was alive. I would read and read and read, and I would say, oh, yeah, that's right, Jesus. You did say that. You said that, didn't you? This is in the book. And I would read and read, and I grew to love him so much. Wow. Now, like I said, the night that I got saved, that that happened, I went home, and I wrote every one of my siblings a letter. And I told them there was a heaven and a hell, and there was a God, there was a devil, and they had to choose. <laughs> and if they didn't choose Jesus, then they were going to die and go to hell. I told, I told the them. 12-year-old Millie was writing. 12-year-old, yeah. And you were the youngest, so many of your siblings youngest. were adults. That's right, but I wrote them all a long letter, and I remember called, and I said, where do I get an address for, the, for, for them? Yeah. Because I found addresses, and I sent them all a letter. Oh, my goodness. And I was, because I was, <laughs> I was born again. I can't explain that to everybody. They say it was just feelings, no. No, no, I was truly born again. I wanted to know God more than anything. I wanted to read the word. I wanted to walk with him. And I got involved in the Lutheran church where I had gotten saved. Yeah. I lived there. And there were so many older people. And then there was this dirty little kid. They kind of took me in and took care of me <laughs> because my family didn't care. Yeah. Nobody ever said, Millie, how are you? Where are you? You know, I just did my own thing. And I got to all these people. And to this day, in fact, just last week, Chet and I went to uh, Temecula and had lunch and dinner with Greg and Jane Trevithek. And his mom and dad were part of my saving grace wow. 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And there's many more, many, many more. And That's by amazing. the time I was 18, um, Wait, I have a, I have a couple questions for you. Yeah. So, so they gave you this Bible uh, yeah. that you went, that you went home and started reading. Do you still have that Bible? No, it fell apart. Okay. I, I've fallen. I've taken many Bibles that have fallen apart. Yeah. No, I didn't. I never even thought about that either. And no, and not until yeah. you know it fell apart. I. It's not until many years later you kind of. Then wish later, it. I got enough money when I was working, and I bought one. Yeah. But I always had a Bible, and I always read it from Genesis to Revelation. So I'm, I'm curious. So um, uh, it seems like in how you're telling your story, you're you're kind of void of any hope at all. I was. And, and Jesus is this like. 
revelation of hope in your yeah. life. So what happens um, when you go home and tell your mom and dad that, hey, uh, some people you don't know picked me up, took me to church, and I believe in Jesus. now. Do- you know, Andy, I told them they said nothing, and I said nothing. So- I thought they probably don't believe it because they don't do it. Yeah. They didn't go to church. Yeah. They never read the Bible. They, we never had a thing. And so I told them, and then they said nothing. <laughs> I don't remember them making a big deal about it. And I thought, okay, well, I know that I know God. Yeah. I know that Jesus is alive. I know that. I can remember. Um, oh, no, that's too far ahead in the story. I won't no, tell you that Don't story. worry about it. You know, uh, one of the things I keep hearing, and I think it's hilarious, and I think young people will have a hard time relating, um, is... There's full generations until maybe 10 years ago. You know, yes. young, young people now, they leave home, and the first thing they do is they grab their cell phone and they text their mom and dad, I'm safe. Um, I, I love hearing all these stories because the theme is um, you just kind of leave the house and yeah. you just kind of... They just left. It's kind of an assumption. They're out there safe. And I think that uh, two of them, <clears throat> my brothers, uh, actually went in service. Oh, okay. They joined uh, one with the army and one was the navy, and oh, wow. they, they went in service. So I knew that, but they didn't come home either. Mm. When they were given leave, they, I just did not have a relationship really with any of them yeah. because I don't know. They were too busy being miserable. I think honestly, when I think back, you got to realize that it was hard for me, and I was only twelve and thirteen, but they had lived. It probably was harder. They used to tell me that my dad was mellow compared to when they were young. Oh, wow. That that I had it a lot easier, and I would not have believed that, but it may have been so. All I know is that they had no desire to have a relationship. They just wanted to get out, and mm-hmm. they did. Hmm. So you're you're 12 years old, and, and you're jumping ahead till 18, and you're saying you're, um, you're living at the Lutheran church it's kind of well, I was there when the doors were open I was there Andy I I scrubbed I washed things I did Sunday school I was in the church from the time the doors were open because I had been born again <laughs> I just don't know how to explain it but I I had been born again I had a new heart a new spirit and I'd say oh I'm going to church and I would walk all the way up this huge hill we were in the country remember now yeah rain sleet and hail and somebody that knew me would swing by and pick me up and we'd go to church and we went to church all the time and and nobody went with me. I just went by myself. Wow. Wow. So so when you're 18, you uh, I, I'm assuming you, you go to high school, mm-hmm. um, you, you finish high school and now you kind of have some. Well, when I was 17, I decided I was going to be involved in child evangelism. OK. Andy, I decided I can still remember when I did. Every child has the right to know what I know. It changed my life. Why wouldn't I tell them? Yeah. So we did tell around. It's We've come to tell the world who Jesus is. And everybody from the church, I got, I think, 25 people to be in the group. And we did tell around for many years. And Andy, we saw thousands of kids come to the Lord. Now, what kind of ministry was that? Was it buses? Was it? We went on buses sometimes. We went, basically, it was parks. Okay. We went to all the parks in the area. We went to the schools. We went to the hospitals. If we knew anybody was in the hospital. You should have seen. There was 20, Gus McCauley, and, and many people were in it. Gus and Peggy and Rose and Ken. I mean. So, so I'm, I, I'm not super familiar with it. So what would you do? You would like go up, go to a park and set up like, would it be like a oh, small We did a play. Yes. Well, oh, we did, a play. Okay. Oh, we did a play. I wrote plays. Okay. Yeah, we did plays. And we say, I think it might have been Peggy and I'm not positive, but somebody that had been in the group told me probably six, four, five, six years ago. They said, Millie, did you ever keep track of how many kids got saved? And I said, no. And they said, I think we had 10,000. Yeah. We went out there. We were there four and five hours in the park telling people about and the people came and sat all around and we had this we had a teledog yeah which was a dog costume a telephant an elephant costume now would you let the kids dress up and and do it well all my workers that worked with me okay. dressed up okay. but the kids just came and we gave them candy so we the- fed them and they came and you know what? We saw thousands of kids get saved. We yeah. really did. And for many, for the next probably 10 years, many of them would even call me. And they would oh, yeah. say, you know, Amelia, I asked Jesus in my heart. And they, and they did. And yeah. so <laughs> I had this burning desire to tell kids about Jesus because of me. 
you knew that it changed your life. I knew it changed it my life, and I world. thought they have a right to know. Yeah. They have a right to know who Jesus is, and I, I wanted to do it so bad. And so everywhere I went, I can remember one time Greg Trevithick, his mom and dad had been like parents to us, and we just, like I said, saw them. They have done a great ministry. They have an, an amazing ministry. Anyway, but his mom and dad were so good to us, and I can remember... They were living in, when Greg, when I first met him, he was living in a commune with probably 50 other kids. And sex and drugs were everywhere. Yes. That's just where it was. And Bob used to come out to our house once a week and we'd pray for Greg and we just cried and cried and cried. And he was, but he was out in the world. Mm. And I, Sandy Long, who is now Tom Long's wife, who is a pastor yeah. right up the street. Yeah, right here in Orange. Yes, right here in Orange. And uh, Sandy Long came to, because of Greg. He, she was living in the commune, and she came because of Greg to my house, and Chester was on the floor, and he was playing with something. My Chester was probably five years old, and uh, so she walked up to him. I know because I was standing in the doorway to listen, and she said to him, uh, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm playing, and so she stood there for a minute, and he said to her, do you know who Jesus is? <laughs> He's five years old, and she said, no, but that's why I'm here. He said, good, because he lives here. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so Millie, I, I'm curious. So you're in Wisconsin. How do you make your way to California? Okay, because we were in Wisconsin when um, I got, uh, when I, we know, we lived in Wisconsin until we got married. Okay, so is I, Ch it, Chet is from Wisconsin. Chet's from Wisconsin. I okay, I, didn't, I don't think I knew that. Yes. Maybe I did, I'm not sure. His dad, you know, graduated from West Point. Yeah. I got tons of awards and things. His background, Andy, was a million times different than mine. He's respected all over that part of the area. His dad was so honored by presidents. I think it was Truman and... and, and wow. Yeah, and he was very, very... Now, just think about this. You have a child. And when I met Chet, it was because I was going to the Lutheran Church already. I'd gotten saved. And so... A, another Lutheran church asked us to go on a retreat with them. So I went on everything. I never missed anything. I, that was my home. And so Chet was there, and we got to talking and, and, and <laughs> liked each other, I guess. Anyway, so we were there, and we after that, he called me, and we would see each other. The first place he ever took me was to his home to meet his mom. Wow. She was the godliest lady I've ever met to this How day. old were you guys? I was probably 19, 18, 19. Okay. Yeah. And so we uh, we started dating, and... I got to know his family, and they took me in, and I just, I thought I'd gone to heaven. I mean, can you imagine? I kept thinking, one day she's going to say, you know, Chet, she comes from a different background than you. Are you sure you want to do this? She never said that. Wow. So when he asked me to marry him, after we'd been dating almost five years, oh, wow, okay. I said, you know, Chet, I have to have permission from two people. And he looks at me, and he goes, What? I said, I can't marry you until I know that it's okay. And he said, who are you going to ask? And I said, God and your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I called her up and said, Grace, I need to come over and talk to you. And so I asked her, I said, if you have any doubt at all. And we've been married 60 years. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. And two sons who served the Lord and yeah. their family. So, so, so you got married. Uh, so how old were you? You were 23, 24? 21. Oh, you're 21 years old. Um, so then you make your way to California from there. Was it? Because Chet was in the service. Okay. And he had six months left when we got married. And he said, I need to come back and do those six months. And so. Where was, was he at? Was he Long Beach or? He was in Long Beach. Okay. Yes. And his mom was, I think she was gone by then. I think she had died by then. Mm. But so we came to California. We didn't know a soul. Yeah. We know. We came on the plane. I did ask his mom, and she said it was okay, so I had that in the back of my mind. But we get here, and the first thing we did was we had to find a church. Hmm. I said, Chet, we have to find a church. Yeah. I'm born again. I kept telling everybody, <laughs> you understand, I'm born again. <laughs> I'm not the same person. I'm born again. So we looked in the news in the telephone book, and we saw the Lutheran Church. Okay. Ethan Linden. 
And Pastor Holloway was the pastor, and he was a great man of God. I, I can't even tell you. So we walked 15 blocks to go to church in the morning, and 15 blocks to come back, and 15 blocks to go again at night, and 15 blocks to come back. What is that? 60 blocks of walking uh, yeah. on Sundays. <laughs> it was on 8th and Linden. And we walked, but we met wonderful people. Those older people just took us in mm. and loved us like, you know, it was, we never felt sorry for ourselves. We found a cute little apartment where you could sit in the bedroom and put your feet in the bathroom that was so little. <laughs> we, we just we just loved it and we got involved and with the church and we got involved with the youth and we crawled in windows to <laughs> we, we were young and we crawled in windows to pretend because we thought some of them were hiding and it was just it was fun so, so just to put it in perspective what what year are we talking about about i was 19 and um so it was, and now I'm 81, so it would be 50, almost 50 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking about the late yeah. 60s. But the pastor and his wife took us in. Yeah. Everybody took us in, and then Chet's mom would come out, and she'd be so impressed that we had a good church, and we were going to church all the time, and it was, <laughs> it was, the, it was the way it was, and we loved it. And then we got involved with the youth. Well, I, I wanted to ask you a question because I, um, I have to imagine that a about that time, Wisconsin and California could oh. they might as well just be two different planets oh. at this point. What, what was it like for you to grow up and come from Wisconsin? Danny, it was D Disneyland. Yeah. Andy, I'm sorry, Danny. Andy, it was Disneyland, of course. I was taken back by everything. I walked the streets and looked at all the buildings. I had never been out of the state I had never met, left Wisconsin. And now we get off the plane. I had never seen the ocean. I had never seen any of it. And I'm just, and Chet's just taken me everywhere. He was still in service. And so he yeah. would go down to the base and he would introduce everything. And I, I don't remember being, ever being sad. When you lived in Wisconsin, were uh, just a total sidebar. I'm just curious. Did, uh, did people kind of talk down on California back then? Like hippies and kind of it's crazy yes, out there. Be careful. Yes. They still do. Oh, well, I know they do now. <laughs> yeah, they still do. When you go back there and you're sitting in a group and you're talking and they go, how come you guys stayed in California? Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't you get out? It's not a good place. Get out. <laughs> yeah. Get out. That's what they say. <laughs> but so, then after we had been married five years and we were very involved in our church, mm -hmm. Grace Wheatley, Pastor Wheatley's wife, was in Sunday school, too, and her and I became best friends, and we were together all the time, and she just taught me so much, and I um, I just love working with kids, and and we just did so many fun things, and I just loved it. I just can't even tell you, I don't remember having a sad day, and Chet and I got along, and we were, and he was involved, and he was still, I think he still had a few months left in service, and so the first six or eight months were just a, a trip for me. They were, I just loved it, I did. And we had people at our house all the time. Well then, Greg gets saved, Greg Travithick. After he'd been in the world and that, he gets saved. And as soon as he gets saved, Bob and Dodie are just ecstatic. And we helped him. We were there. I, I walked around cars saying, Greg, listen to me. Your mom and dad know what they're talking about. Anyway, he got saved. And when he did, he, he changed totally. And everything, and Bob and Dodie and all of them, we just all praise God. And Greg was living in a commune, like what I said, with 50. Yeah. They all got saved. Wow. I just got a picture of it. I should pull it up on my phone of the group of them. And they just sent it to me, and they said, here's just some familiar faces you might know. They were. They got saved. I'll get the picture from you. And we'll put it on yes. the YouTube video. So yes. Can... Yes. Yes. I got a picture in my okay. in my phone, okay. and they did. They came. I like I said. They came. They would call, and Greg would say, "You know, Melly, I need to bring so and so out. They need to get saved." And I'd say, "But you know, it's it's Monday night or Sunday night, and we have to go to work tomorrow. And maybe you can hold them off." Or, no, 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 can't hold them off. They told the devil they only have two more hours, and then they're getting saved. They would walk in the door of our living room and fall on the ground and say, "I want to know Jesus." 
because they would been in the world for such a long time. Uh, Drugs, alcohol, sex. I mean, just, and now Bob and Dodie were just flying high. Greg was born <laughs> again and washed in the blood. And they were, and he, they, he brought all of his friends. That's a, and we did it over and over and over and over. So you were mentioning um, that you had to go to work in the morning. What, what were you doing? Oh, for, I went to work. What were you doing for work at that time? I was working at the bank. Oh, okay. I worked in a bank, so did Chet. Chet was an officer. I was just a teller. But, yeah, we both worked in banks. And, okay. uh, yeah, and I would get up and go to work. It just, you know, I was not that old, and I just went to work, and he did too. And these kids, like I said, they would say, oh, no, we can't wait another day. <laughs> Lawrence and Linda, if you could see them, we went and met with some of them just, like I said, a few weeks ago. And um, here's the miracle. They all serve God. Yeah. Here's the miracle that they love Jesus and have led other people to Jesus. Yeah. And I believe in it. I do. I, I knew for sure. But I also knew that I wanted to teach kids. Yeah. So I taught children's ministry. I taught moms for 15 years. I taught children's ministry for At 25 years. And, and did you begin doing that at the Lutheran Church? Yeah, I did some of it at the Lutheran Church. And then what happened with the Lutheran Church is Pastor Holloway died. Oh, wow. <laughs> he was older. He was an older pastor from okay. the very beginning. Okay. And his wife had some serious problems, and the whole thing kind of changed. And so that was when we started going to Melody Land. Okay. We went to Melody Land Christian Center because I had friends. I have people here in this audience every Sunday that was at Melody Land with me. Yeah. One of them is George and Gail Pla. Yeah. And so we had friends, and so we were going to Melody Land, and people were getting saved all the time, like I said, and we just were happy, and we just loved it. Yeah. Th that, too, had changes after 10, 15 years. So before we get to that, um, how did you find yourself? So so uh, your pastor that you, you adored and you loved, he passed away. Yeah. And now you're looking for a new church. You end up at Melody Land. How did you end up working at Melody Land? Because somebody that I can't think who it was. It might have been Cause Harmon. Somebody that knew me had been at Melody Land for a while, and they went to pastor um, you know, um, Wilkerson, and they said, this couple is coming, and she works with kids, and you need to use her. And so they called me up. Okay. And they said, would you be interested? And I said, of course. I'm, you know, I love kids. So I started working with kids. I did it for 25 years. I taught parenting classes for 20 years. Yeah. And I just believed in it, Danny. Or not Danny. Andy. I know I you know who I am. Yeah. You're fine. Yeah, I believed in it because I saw the difference in so many. Every time I was with Greg and Jane, I would think, ah, she, he was a mess. I mean, he was out there getting drunk, sitting on the s street corners. So you saw right in front of you, you just saw the evidence of what God, the, what God, God could, could do. do. And I yeah. said, why would we tell everybody? Yeah. So then we started tell around and we went... <laughs> And told everybody. We had kids in the park, and they would come. And I remember one time some city official in Anaheim, I can't remember his name now because I'm old, but some city official said that they drove by the park. They heard about us, and they saw a cloud of glory hanging over the park. And they said, I understand your ministry was there, and you were t teaching children. And I said, yeah, we do it at least once a month, sometimes twice a month. And he said, you guys must really know God because there was a glory cloud over the park. Wow. And we just kept doing it. We just kept telling people <laughs> about Jesus. And we wouldn't stop, Andy, because I had gotten saved. You knew the power of I God. Pow I knew it. And I wasn't going to let some kid die and go to hell because I didn't tell him. Now, now, Millie, I know a lot of people will immediately flash back and they'll know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. but many won't. Um, Many are, you know, maybe new with us or they're tuning in online and they've never. So, so paint a picture because, you know, sometimes people are, are coming from various church backgrounds and they're thinking about children's ministry or Sunday school. Your children's program at Melody Land is not just a classroom with a handful of kids. No. So on a Sunday morning, how many services, how many kids, how many workers? We had probably 200 teachers. Teachers. Under me. Yeah. Yes. 200. Yeah. Ralph Wilkerson told me that the children's ministry had never been alive. He was the pastor then. 
And he wanted it alive. And he wanted it alive. And he told me to stay. I was thinking of leaving because I had other offers with some of the gospel people. They wanted me to come and work with them. But um, I can't explain it except to keep saying it over and over. Andy, when I got saved, I was saved. And you just knew. I just, I'd look at kids on the street corner and I'd think, I mean, I bet they don't know who Jesus is. Hmm. It's and just I would an, uh, just an urgency. And I had twenty five people in Teleround. Some of them go to this church. Yeah. Right here. And we we went out and just told everybody that would come. We knocked on doors. We'd walk up the streets in, <laughs> in the neighborhood where the park was. And we already had the park set up. So now it would take about 15 of us. We'd go out and knock on doors and say, we're doing a children's program in the park and you can come. And the kids would come. And we would tell them about Jesus and they would get saved. Yeah, that's amazing. And we took my kids with me. <laughs> Chester and Scotty were little. Oh, let's, let's back up. So um, tell me about um, when, when your kids are born. I mean... Talk about a monumental change in life. Now you you get kids of your own. So so that was, and people might not know. So uh, uh, Chester and Scott both are um, they they belong to yeah. you. Yeah, they belong to me. <laughs> I wanted them after what I'd come through. Yeah, can you imagine? Were you were you afraid to have kids after what you had gone oh, through? Oh, I had read every book there was to read. Yeah. That's why now I'm writing the ABCs to discipline. Yeah. I'm writing the book because I know people, young mothers need it. Mm. You can't expect your kids to grow up on their own in a world like today. You've got to invest in them. And, um, yeah, you know, it's too important. It really is too important. Kids have a right to know who Jesus is. So, so you're, you're today's special guest and you're the finale of season one. So I'm going to give you a platform right here, right now. Um, tell us what Scott and Chester were like as little kids. I loved them. Oh, of course you loved them, Billy. They were naughty, just like little boys are naughty. <laughs> Scotty especially, he fought a little bit with the kids in the neighborhood and, and, <laughs> and, I knew they'd go serve God. I used to tell Chet all the time, I don't care how not he is. He's going to serve God with his life. That's just the way it is. And so is Chester. And they did. Yeah. And they served God. And yes, and I spanked him. I believe in spanking. <laughs> the ABC is discipline. The S is for spanking. Anyway, I spanked him. I made him mind. And this is what they say. And my grandkids, all six of them, say the same thing. She loved us to death, but she made us mind. Yeah. I, I, I worked with schools and I worked with churches for so many years that I saw how kids are treated that have no respect for authority. Yeah. They're put on a chair in the back of the room and ignored as much as possible. And I made up my mind that my kids weren't going to be to that. I was going to teach them to respect authority. Mm. I was going to teach them to do what they were told to do. And they never had any problem in their school years. Yeah. And I, I believe in all that, see? And I read so many books. I, Larry Christensen's book, The Value of the Christian Family, it's one of the better books in the world that anybody can read if you're raising children. It's just absolutely... But I read them all. I read all Dr. Dobson's, and I said, my kids are not going to grow up and not know. And they, my grandkids say all the time, Grandma, we remember. We remember that. You made us mind. Yeah. So, yeah, I loved it. I loved having kids. Yeah, I loved it. And then they gave me grandchildren and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And hmm. to this day, also Ellie's going to be 30 and Dylan and Megan are 25 and Kyle, Kate and Samantha are 22. Wow. And I've grown up with all of them and I love them to pieces. Yeah. You, you know, I, I, I think we'll, we'll get there. But you know what's so, so cool is, um, you know, the Bible talks at length about generations. Yes. And I, I think if we could just summarize a lot of what the Bible's saying about generations is if you do nothing, the next generation will be like the previous one. And so if the previous one is full of sin and darkness and you do Absolutely. nothing. Absolutely. So I'm just struck, Millie, already, and I'm sure we'll talk more uh, in a few minutes as we get there. But uh, you really, in, in coming to know Jesus, started a brand new trajectory oh. for the entire family. I can't imagine Although people tell me all the time, Millie, you're just an exception. Andy, I can't imagine that when you come to know Jesus that you don't Im immediately change. Yeah. I was changed. I w I'm going to say it again, okay? You guys, I was born again. 
from the time I walked out. I knew Jesus was with me. He never left me. I was a dirty little kid. I was little then, skinny. And I knew Jesus was with me. I had that secret in my heart. And I wasn't going to let anybody take it away from me. Mm. Yeah. That's why I did it So for kids. Yeah. I told kids after kids after kids, you know, that's why I made sure my boys, I used to sit in their room in the dark. They were laying in their beds and I would reach out and touch them and I would pray and pray and I'd say, the, uh, the enemy cannot have my kids. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and I said, my kids are going to serve God. They're, and I told them and told them, <laughs> we would, we, every night I put them to bed, I'd say, now just remember, God's alive and he's here and he sees you. I, and my kids to this day, and I'm talking about Chester and Scotty, who are going to be in their 60s, will say, you know what? We never doubted it. Yeah. We knew. Yeah. That's, that's so awesome. I knew. I knew they were going to serve God. I used to tell them, you have the talent. Why do you think God gave that to you? Yeah. Why did God allow you to do that? For you to use it. Don't bury it. If you don't use it, you'll bury it, and then you'll be alone, and the enemy will have free hand. Yeah. He can't if you walk with God. If you don't walk with God, you walk alone. Mm. But if you walk with God, God walks with you. Amen to that. So, so you know what? We're, um, we're kind of jumping forward, so let's jump forward here. You're, you're working at Melody Land. Yep. Um, you're doing Tell Around. Yep. Sundays are 200 teachers, thousands of yes, kids. Yes, thousands. Um, you know, we don't need to go into detail, but, you know, things don't end up working out super well at Melody Land. I love Ralph and Eileen Wilkerson, and they have been very nice to me. Okay. But as you go in the Lord... And as you see what God is doing elsewhere, um, I just I just felt God said that we should make a change. Mm -hmm. And Chet did too. Yeah. Um, he he was just along with me on every step of the way, and and he did. And so when we decided that, we prayed about it for a long time. Yeah. I tell Ellie right now, she knows she's just been married for a few, well, almost a year now. And I tell her all the time, I go, Ellie, listen, you have a home now. Make it a godly home from day one. Yeah. Don't let the enemy come in hmm. and steal it away from you. Yeah. God blessed you with that. And that's, I tell all my grandkids that. And they still love me and we, we do. <laughs> <laughs> I did make them mine. Anyway, but it is true, isn't it? You have a little boy. Yeah. And once you want him to serve God all of his life. Yeah. It's what you put in him stays with him. It yeah. doesn't go away. My kids will still say, Mom, remember when you did this and this and this? And I go, yeah, I do. And do you? And they go, yeah. <laughs> you know, no question about it. And they would bring their kids. I mean, their friends. Yeah. And they would get saved. Mm. Because it's not a joke. No, it's not. There is a heaven and there is a hell. Yeah. There is a God and there is a devil. And I want my kids to go to heaven. Yeah. I want to tell them. And so we've told them many, many, many times. Yeah. So, um, you know, we... We kind of know because we know some of the backstory, but many people don't. So you have this this burning message that you just want people to know. Kids. But, yeah, kids. And at the same time, kind of where you're at and where you're going to church, what was your home church, starts to in some ways fall apart. Well, it's partly because uh, he died. Yeah. His wife died. And there was changes. Yeah. And that's when we decided... At that time, somebody had, like I said, had told Ralph Wilkerson, I should be working right. with children. Right. So you go to, you go to Melody Land, and, and that, that church starts to kind of crumble as well. Yes, yes, so tell does. us the story of how you end up on, um, I guess, in kind of what you would call launching a church. You would say you're part of the launch team. So, yeah. so day one of what we now know as Bridge was, was Zion Community Church. So I, I think this is maybe going to be the part where people start to connect the dots a little yeah. bit. So um, tell us a little bit about that season where Zion Community Church becomes your new church home. Like I said, when we decided we were going to leave Melody Land, there was a lot of financial problems at that time in that church. Yeah. And there was a lot of other problems. Yeah. There's, so we prayed about it a long time. And probably one of the main reasons that we made the switch with as little problems as we did is that many of our friends started to go hmm. to Melody Land. And they would come back and say, oh, you guys, you ought to come. Well, I can remember um, 
Chet and I decided to go one Sunday. We're going to go to Melody Land. And uh, then he ended. I don't know why he didn't get to come. I think he was sick. And I said, well, I'm going to go anyway because I've told all my friends that they have to go to church. And I'm going to Melody. I'm going to. And so we got there. And here comes Greg in his car. And, and several people came. And they were all there. And I remember that we walked around the parking lot. And we all, there were six of us, I think. It was Tom and Sandy were there, and Greg was there, and I think he was, I don't, can't remember who he was married to at that time, probably um, Linda. Anyway, and so they were all there, and we walked around, and we said, God, is this where you want us? Is this where you want us? Mm. Because we don't want to go anywhere where you don't want us. And then I said, I remember saying, yeah, but they have a lot of kids here. Yeah. I bet they don't all know Jesus. And I got a message for them. I, I, don't you know that we that's part of our ministry for Teleron is to tell kids about Jesus? Yeah. There's a lot of kids here. And so we just made that. We did. Mm. And we went to see Pastor Wilkerson. Yeah. And he gave me a job and, and I went on staff. Yeah. And um, we saw kids get saved. We used to do vacation Bible school and sometimes 100 kids would get saved. Wow. So, so you're yeah. you're working there, and I'm I'm assuming that's um, where you start to build relationships with people like like Noel and Phyllis and mm -hmm. John and and mm -hmm. Ruth Ann, and mm -hmm. um, so as as Melody Land starts to you know have some issues, and you guys kind of launch out and start this church. Um, well, we were very close to Noel and Phyllis and John and Ruth Ann. Okay, and so Noel called me one day, and he said, Millie, I want you to know that we are going to make a break." We're going to do this God's way. And we don't think that we can do that if we stay at Melody Land. So we've been talking to this man who has a building that is empty. And we're thinking that maybe we could buy that and start our own church. Mm. Well, I, I didn't care. I was going to go where they went as long as there were kids. I loved kids. <laughs> I do. I love kids. And I thought, if, if there's kids there, then I'll go work with the kids. Mm. Why not? I can do that. And so we all did. We all kind of made the move at the same time in yeah. the same place. And I'll never forget the first Sunday we went upstairs and and um, they had the youth there. And they had tons of kids, youth there. And I remember thinking, this is right. This is right. Look at all of these kids can't be saved. They can't all know they're going to go to heaven. So we started, then we started up tell around again. Yeah. And we started going out to the parks and we started going out to the churches and we started going out and we just, that's what we did. And like I said, we had telephant. Gus was telephant. <laughs> he was the elephant. And so many of them, people that we know. And we all just, we just kept telling people about Jesus. Yeah. Andy, we did it for six years. Every week we were out there telling somebody about Jesus. Mm. And that was before they told you you couldn't go see somebody because they were in the hospital like today. Oh. We can't do anything. We just went to the hospitals and we stood around beds and we prayed and they cried and we prayed over them. Yeah. But it was in all of us. Yeah. Gus and Peggy and Don and Anita, we were all in it. And we went and told them. And I'd do it again. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things I love about this is, you know, um, I mean, you worked at a church for decades. Yeah. But one of the things I love that you, you keep talking about is even as you're talking about, you know, working at a church, yeah. all your stories don't happen, you know, sitting in an a no. office chair, do they? No. They, they happen in places like at a hospital bed. They happen Absolutely. in a park. And, you know, that's, um, that's such a good reminder. Yeah. Um, but that's what we're we're called to do. You know, there's something as a job, and yeah. you know, you get a paycheck yeah. at a job. But there's a difference between a job and a calling. And I can I, I can remember when Ralph Wilkerson called me in one day, and I was scared, of course. Ralph <laughs> Wilkerson was very famous in those days. Yeah, very famous. And he said to me, "How do you get people to come and get saved?" I mean, I worked in Sunday school. That was easy. I could go in there and tell them about Jesus. I did it all the time. Right. In fact, I was, I was the head of the Sunday school for a long time. But he's meaning, how do you get them to come into the parks and everything? I said, we do what God would do. We just walked around and told them. Yeah. 
Jesus did that. He walked the streets, didn't he? He walked the thing. And wherever he met people, he told them. It's so interesting because as as kind of technology changes, we're always looking for like a, a yeah. quick, easy, fast oh. way. Oh. When the original way of just walking around and, you know, meeting real people face to face is still the we best way. We would go into the parks, Andy, and we would say we would tour it like this. We'd look around and we'd get up on a bench or something. Where is the most people? We're going to go there. Let's go there and let's tell them about Jesus. And the group I, that worked with me, they were wonderful. Like I said, they were Tom and Sandy. They were, uh, 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 you know, um, George and Gail. They were people that we know and they all worked together. And we all served God together. Yeah. And it was wonderful. And we would leave there and we'd say, did you see that one little girl? She really was born again. Yeah. She really was saved. And we got letters from them. Andy, they would send us letters. <laughs> because we gave them all a piece of paper with our name and our pictures on it. So that they would know who wow. we were. And then we would get letters. And we would say, oh my gosh, she really did mean it. Or he really did mean it. And we did it. We loved it. Mm. We loved Tell Around. We did it for, like I said, about six years. Wow. Wow. So you guys, um, you transitioned and yeah. um, you transitioned to this this church. And, you know, there there's lots and lots of stories. But from the early days of um, Zion Community Church. Yes. Um, what are some of the things that stand out to you about the early days here? When Chet and I decided, like I said, it partly has to do with Noel and uh, uh, Pastor John. And you just, you just love them dearly. They, we were, they were part of my family. By that time, Scotty and Linda were dating, and I was pretty sure they were going to get married. And by that time, I had led all of Noel and Phyllis's kids to the Lord. At one time or another, I would, uh, I would call them up and ask them if they knew Jesus. <laughs> and um, see, because I, I, I know I keep saying it, but Andy, I was born again. Yeah. And you wanted other people to experience Did. what you had. Did. I had had such a hard childhood. I remember going to bed hungry so many times. I remember, like I said, never having a new dress. I remember when I would be in a bed in a freezing. It would be cold outside, 10 below zero, 15 below zero, and didn't have enough blankets. I remember those years. Hmm. And then I remember when I got saved. And I just knew. I knew if God was alive that he could take care of me. And he did. For all those years, yeah. he did. And I never, ever doubted it. Now, that's only because God did it. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. He just did it. Yeah. He said, you see that dirty little kid down there? If we don't help her, she ain't going to make it. Hmm. And they did. And God sent his angels. And that was the, the consistent theme. Of, you just wanted everyone to know all about I told. It. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. said, I said, I was with Kyle, my grandson. He is 20. <clears throat> three and now and he was with me in the car the other day and he said called me and he said grandma could we pick up my friend her mom was supposed to pick her up and or him up but her car broke down and I said yeah we'll go get him so I go over and pick up Kyle and he gets in the car and I said okay where does your friend live and we'll go get him and Kyle gets in the car and he says to me uh, so grandma are you going to tell him about heaven and hell <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at Kyle and I said, Kyle, is he your friend? And he said, yeah. And I said, I'm, a, I'm ashamed that you haven't told him about heaven and hell. And he says, I know, I think I should. <laughs> <laughs> I better do it before you do. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, so you might as well do it. <laughs> That's right. And you know what? That's what it's all about. Yeah. He's real. Yeah. He's not dead. He's alive. He said, two or more there am I in the midst of them. He says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Yeah. He says, I go before you and make a way. You'll never be without a way, ever. I was never without a way. I can remember one time. We were poor, okay? Like I said, I don't ever remember getting a new dress. And I don't remember really getting Christmas presents. I'm sure I must have got something. But uh, like I said, w we were poor because my dad drank it all up. Um, and I can remember one time I laid on the floor and I was praying and praying. And I was saying, you know, God, I just want to know this is you. I, by that time, I think I was married. But... Um, I was just crying out. I don't know what, some big crisis in my life anyway. I just remember crying and laying on the floor. And I said, God, you need to show me that this is you. And I said, God, if you're real 
and you're going to show me that this is real and I'm doing the right thing, then I want somebody to walk through that door and put $500 on that table over there. And I haven't told anybody we're having a hard time financially. I think it was 1000 in fact. I don't think it was 500 I think it was 1000 And I didn't tell Chet. And he came home, I said, and I said, I want him to do it by 9 o'clock tonight. And I didn't tell Chet, and we had dinner. I didn't, I give you my word, he didn't know. The doorbell rang. Guess who was there? Hmm. Ruth Ann. Wow. John. With a check. They didn't know. Wow. They didn't know that we were having a hard time. They walked in. They said, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry, but we really felt God told us to do this, and we're sorry, we're sorry. And they walked across to us and to the dining room table, laid an envelope, and walked out. Wow. That's just one. Yeah. That- I'll tell you story after story. I feel like God said... She won't make it without me. I'm going to have to help her all the time. So he helps me all the time. I can't help it. And he does. And I love him. And I know that he was there for every... I can't... Do you know that when I was... Um, before I got married, I decided that it would be nice because I had friends who did it. Um, when I, if I'm talking too much, just tell me to oh, stop. No, no, no. Keep going. And, and I decided that um, I would like to go to college like they did. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, there was no money for me to go to college. Let's get that straight. Um, but I just decided that, that I wanted to go to college, too. Yeah. And I had to walk 15 blocks to get to the college, the Long Beach, I mean, um, not Long Beach. Uh, yeah, Long Beach. Yeah, it was at that time. I think it was Long Beach City College. Anyway, I decided that I wanted to go. And I didn't tell anybody. And one day, and I promise you, I didn't tell it. I just kept praying about it. I, and I, one day the phone rang and this lady said, this is Long Beach City College and I just want you to know that your way has been paid for the next two years. Wow. I don't know, Andy, to this day who did it. Wow. <laughs> I can go on. I mean, there's story after story after story. Of just God's faithfulness. Because God said, she ain't going to make it. Yeah. I used to... So, so Millie, I, I, um, I love... I love something that you said. Um, you said something about the reason that you came here was because um, John and Ruth Ann and Noel and Phyllis were your family. And I got to imagine from some of the stories you, you've talked about in the background, um, God knew you needed a family. Mm-hmm. I did. Um, but I think one of the things, especially if people are not familiar with you, they, they're probably familiar with, you know, we had all these images and stuff because we threw you a, a giant retirement party a handful of months back. And one of the things that I I think came through really clearly at your retirement party is you have some amazing friends. I do. Uh, What what has it been like to not only follow Jesus and, uh, you know, serve in ministries and lead kids to Jesus, but get to do it alongside so many friends? I know so many people that don't have one single friend Mm -hmm. and you have you have a handful. I do. What has it been like to, to serve God alongside of, you know, your friends are goofy, they're hilarious, they play pranks on you, but they're also, they're also there for you. Mm-hmm. What, what is that like for you? See, I don't have any doubt, Andy, and neither what none of us do. We have a core of about six yeah. that have been friends for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I don't have any doubt that if any of us, and that we all say it to each other, if we have any need, they're there. Mm-hmm. See, when... when uh, with her, uh, Andrea, when she started getting in our group, and her husband you know, it was a doctor. Alan was a great doctor. In fact, he has a very high reputation. But when they had anything to pray for, for their kids or anything, we all went together and did it. Hmm. We worked as a team yeah. for years and years and years. Not only with John and Ruth Ann and um, uh, uh, Phyllis and, and Noel, but we... We did it with others, too. We did it with uh, people we got to know, and we wanted to help them. We reached out, and we saw so many people that um, to this day, to this very day, and when I go home today, this is what I'm going to do. I will call the 50-plusers because now that I've gotten old, I don't work with the children as much, although I would love to. I work with the seniors. Yeah. And so once a week, I call them all, 70 of them. 
Yeah. And you're not exaggerating. No, I'm not exaggerating. You used, you used to work here, and I know for certain. Yes, you could. I'm talking eight straight hours of I just. I could show you the calls. list. Yeah. I could show you the list. So if you're listening, Millie is being totally serious. She will yes. call 70 people. Yes. Well, actually, some of them were. They're not all. Some of them were two people. You know, they were husband and wife. Yeah, sure. But the, Evie, no, no less than 50. In fact, who was it? Said Millie, it was more than 50. Look at there's the, the list goes down to 66 or 65. And I yeah. said, well, anyway, I call them all, and I call them to for two reasons. Number one, I want to make sure they're well, and they, if they need anything, that mm. that's what we're for. We're not here. I'm not put on this earth to sit in a chair and watch time go by. I'm here to put on this earth to thank Jesus for saving my soul. Yeah. For bring, making a place for me when I didn't have one. Mm. I, just imagine Chet's mom, when he went away to service, she took me in for four and a half years, and I lived with her. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, I lived with my mother, future mother-in-law for four and a half years. Chet was in service, and he was gone, so she said, Millie, you might as well come and live with us. Wow. She was the godliest person I've ever met. To this day, now she's gone home to be with the Lord. But I was, I was accepted. Yeah. Now you got to put yourself in my my position. How many times I doubted it, but God always said, "Millie, you're mine." Hmm. I, I I I I made you. I I and I caused you to know me. It isn't by mistake. Yeah. Wow. And all I can say over and over is, I was born again. Yeah. I walked out of that church, and if the whole world would have lined up and said, you honestly think, you dirty little kid, that you're born again? And I would say, oh, I know I am. Yeah. He changed my heart. Yeah. See, and I did. I knew it. Mm. From that day to this day, as I sit in this chair, Jesus Christ is alive and real. Yeah. And he saved me. Yeah. And you know what? So often, uh, Millie, I just know your heart is uh, always looking outward and, and mm -hmm. thinking of others. But, you know, you've had a, a handful of years where you've had, you know, some, yes. some issues is, issues yourself. You've, you know, how many back surgeries did you end up having? Three. Three back surgeries. And, you know, some of the recovery was very, yes. very rough on you. Of course I did. In the midst of all of that, you know, um, you know, just getting getting older and having the issues with your back. What, Do you want to talk about getting older too? Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> yes. It's it's how God created it, right? That's right. How have you felt like um, your relationship with God has changed? You know, because you're you're such a goer, go go go. You're such a doer. You're just on the move. What was it like for you to feel like physically you couldn't be on the move? How did how did you feel like your relationship with God? You know. Well, I have a grandson, Kyle, who is 21. And he will not let his grandma sit in a chair. Grandma, get up. We're going to walk, 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 walk. And I tell him all the time, Kyle, look at me. I'm 81 years old. I can't climb that hill anymore. I used to climb it with him yeah. and all of my uh, grandchildren. It hasn't always been easy because after I've had this last surgery, mm -hmm. which was a pretty good-sized bulge, and it was connected to the sciatica, and there's no question about it. Andy, I, I've had my degree of pain. Um, and the doctor even told me, he said, whenever you cut the back open, it takes a long time for it to totally heal. So it isn't like I wasn't prepared, but I was. But at the same time, see, I, I don't want you to think that I'm saying things because God treated me different. No, at the same time, God was never, he never let me alone. Yeah. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would know God was there. I would read the word and it was like he was talking to me. Mm -hmm. And I would have people, I would have a need. Listen, I didn't deserve it. Okay. To God be the glory. I would have a need. I would pray and it would be answered. Wow. I don't know how to explain that. But the fact that I just, I can see that dirty little kid standing in the back of that room. I can see that. I heard what the man said and I thought, that can't be true. <laughs> and then he, he touched me. Mm -hmm. I remember walking out that day from that church. It was in the Lutheran church. And I remember walking out that day and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm born again. Yeah. I'm born. That's what he said. It says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I said it a million times. I wanted the enemy to know that he wasn't going to have my body. I was going to serve God. Yeah. yeah. 
And I've told my grandkids and my kids the same thing. Hmm. Hmm. That's what I said. I tell, I tell them, you have a choice. You serve God or you serve the enemy, but you can't serve both. Yeah. Wow. So, Millie, as we as we kind of wrap up a um, little bit today, I, um, I'm just struck, I think, before we head for the finish line, I, I'm just struck that from from a very early age, I, I think as God got a hold of your heart. Yeah. I, I love that about you that you're just you just go, go, go. Not not in the sense that you're achieving because God's impressed, but because God did something for you that you felt like I have no choice but I want everyone to know about it. And That's you what know, I told every kid I read it, see him on the road and I tell him. Yeah. I, I think that um you know, it's just such a testimony to what it means to follow God is, you know, it's important to sit and read a Bible and it's important to pray and it's important to have those, yes, those moments. Is. But God also calls us to come and he takes us on adventures through life. And I, I think one of the things that's always struck me about you is um, you are the person who gets up. You do call 70 people. Uh, calling 70 people is not Say easy. 50 or 60, but I call them. And, and you know what, frankly, if we're just honest, I'd imagine as, as those people you call are getting older, some of those phone calls end up, you know, being harder to hear. Um, over time, people want to talk longer. They're lonely. And that and, is the truth. And, and so, you know what, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't come easy. Serving God doesn't always come easy. No. But I, I think uh, what we've heard is just this beautiful adventure that God's taken you on. And I love so much that even though we threw you a retirement party, you are not retired. No, so you're going to you're going to you're probably going to be laying in a hospital in a decade. <laughs> And you're going to be you're telling not. some young nurse, hey, do you know about Jesus? <laughs> I told my nurses when I was in yeah. <laughs> about Jesus. I told all three of them. Yeah. So, you know, as we wrap up, I'm just I'm just curious if if um, you could just leave a couple parting words with people. What, what would you say to, to someone? Maybe they're new and they're like, I have no idea who Millie is. I see her in church. She sits way over there. What would you say to somebody who's who's new? I would say that if we are breathing air, it's because God gave us the ability to do that. Mm. If we're alive and we're not in a hospital bed, Chet and I drive down the road and I say to Chet, see somebody sitting on the street corner. I said, let's just pray and thank God that we aren't there right now. Yeah. I just think God's not dead. He's alive. And he wants to change all of our life. Yours and mine. It's not maybe. And this is what I stand on Psalms 8. Five, the Lord will give grace and mercy. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Hmm. I have been blessed. Not only that God blessed me and gave me food when I didn't have any a couple of times and put money on the floor when I walked in a room and saw money laying there when I needed money. Not only that, I've been blessed that I feel his presence. Yeah. I've been blessed that when I pray sometimes at night, it's just like I see him sit standing on the edge of the bed there. Yeah. And he says, Millie, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to. I, sure, I make mistakes. And he punishes me. Let's get it straight. I've been punished by the great I am because there are times I knew it was wrong and did it anyway. And he says, Millie, it's not the way to walk. Yeah. And he'll let me walk through that. But he has never left me. Hmm. Never. And when you think about that, Andy, I'm an old lady. I'm at 81 years old, and I have the assurance that God walks with me every day. Yeah. See, it doesn't get better than that. No. Yeah. And I get to pass that on to my kids, which I did, and now to my grandkids. Hmm. And every kid that I have a chance, I might tell your son someday when he gets a little older. And he, if I'm still here, I might tell him, hey, do you know who Jesus is? I said to... <laughs> I said to one of the young people, I can't remember their name because I'm old, I forget names. <laughs> I said to one of them yesterday, because it's somebody that I've watched grow up. He's been little and he's grown up. Right. And I, I just put my arm around him and I said, you still know who Jesus is, don't you? And he looked at me like this and I said, I just want to make sure you're born again. Yeah. And he laughed and he said, yeah, I did it in vacation Bible school many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that important? Isn't that what we're here for? Yeah. And, and you know what? Every, every person has kind of a different sphere of influence, you know, whether it's their workplace or, uh, you know, their family or their school or whatever it is. But I think, Millie, as we, as we wrap up, I, I think um, 
I think so many people know you, but our church is growing. And I, I think sitting down and having this conversation is important because there will be years and years from now where, you know, people will maybe forget who we are by name. But our legacy yeah. is that, you know, See, we, I believe that we we left the understanding of who God is and how to serve him. Mm -hmm. um, and while we might not be remembered by name, um, our legacies will live on and your legacy certainly is living on. And uh, people who came to know Jesus because of you and now they have kids that are running around church. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm going to send you a copy of that group because okay. they just got together a few uh, about a month ago, and they sent me, and they said, Millie, you'll recognize a lot of these faces. They all got saved 20, 30 years ago, and they're all still saved. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, we're going to wrap up, Millie. I, um, I want to encourage people, if, if they're listening, um, if you're standing on the stage looking out at the audience, Millie sits kind of over here in the, the front right. Uh, Millie, you're one of the most social, friendly people I've ever met. So I'd imagine um, I have the freedom to invite people to come and say hello. You can invite anybody you want. Yeah. They can come to my house. I tell them all the time. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Here's where I live. If you ever need anybody, if you just need... Knock right on the door. Yeah, just knock on the door, and I've had it many times. Yeah. So if you're listening, don't don't hesitate. Come introduce oh. yourself to, to Millie. Um, oh. Say hello, and, and I'm sure you'll strike up a great friendship. But Millie, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for making the time. Thank you for sharing these stories and I think um, more than anything I think God is is glorified because of your testimony he is so thank you so much we don't deserve it but he gives it amen to that thank you you're welcome so we'll thank sign you, off thank you <laughs>